Well, today uh, I was thinking about some different uh, ways to introduce this sermon because some of the sermon talks about uh, putting on clothes and taking off clothes, and I decided, well, I'm not going to take off any clothes for you. Thank you. Thank you. It's the most applause I've ever gotten. But, you know, I was thinking about buying clothes. You know, when you go out and buy clothes, and uh, it's, it's always an experience in our house when you go out and buy clothes because Amy and I are just polar opposites when it comes to purchasing clothes. For example, you know, she's very detail-oriented. Um, I'm not, but she's very detail-oriented. You know, and just thinking about pants, uh, she wants to know, are the pants tapered? Is there a crease line in the pants? Uh, do the back... Uh, Pockets have buttons in the pants. Where are the front pockets uh, positioned on the pants? Does the, do the pants have double bar tacks? Do the pants have a J-stitch? You know, what, what kind of front rise are in the pants? What kind of back rise are in the pants? And for me, I'm like, do they fit? <laughs> That's about the end of it, you know, for me. And same thing when it comes to cost. You know, Amy's very good at finding things on sale. She wants to find things on sale and, and help the family financially, you know. And so she'll go through the ads. She has uh, coupons, double coupons. Uh, she's got Kohl's cash, Penny's payments, Ross's reserves, Nordstrom's notes, Burlington's bullion, Dillard's dough, and Macy's moolah. She's into all that stuff. <laughs> she keeps track of all of it. And for me, I don't even realize there's a price. I, I'm just, I like it. And so, you know, I end up getting it regardless of the price and usually get in trouble later for that, you know. When it comes to style, Amy knows what's in style. She, she's very up on what, what is in style. Um, for me, my, my philosophy is when I go into men's warehouse or someplace, I immediately look for the mannequins. And I find a mannequin that I like, and I'm like, I like that. Put that on me. And, you know, usually the salesperson will say, well, sir, uh, that mannequin has a 24-inch waist. <laughs> I'm like, what are you saying? You want to make the sale or not? You know, I've got a 24-inch head, so what's the big deal? <laughs> so, you know, but literally, I look at mannequins, and I'm like, I like that, or, uh, you know, beyond that. But Amy's taught me a few things, a few rules when it comes to style, okay? And these are the rules as I understand them. No whites after Labor Day, no pinks after Mother's Day, no darks after Boxing Day. I'm, I'm pretty sure those are the rules, at least best to understand them. So, you know, y'all pray for her. Uh, she's got a lot, <laughs> a lot of work that she needs to do to help me. And, um, you know, there's one thing, there's one universal thing about, about clothing um, no matter the style, and this is very deep, I, the, is, I want you to be able to take this home. I want you to be able, you know, if uh, someone says, what did you learn from your pastor today? And it's this. Sometimes you take clothes off, and sometimes you put clothes on. Isn't that deep? Isn't that a blessing to you? That you, no matter what the style, no matter what the cost, you know, no matter where you got the clothes, sometimes you got to put clothes Take them off, and sometimes you've got to put them on. We do it all the time. And by the way, let me just say something that most pastors will not tell their congregations today. Thank you for putting on clothes today. <laughs> you know, most pastors, and it's a shame, but most pastors in this country just take it for granted that, they're, that the congregation comes to church clothed. But not me. I'm grateful beyond more that, than you'll ever know. Um, but speaking of clothes, and here's the, here's the incredible segue that I've prepared for this sermon. There are spiritual clothes that we need to take off and spiritual clothes that we need to put on. And that's what we're going to talk about a little bit today. In Colossians chapter 3, verses 5 through 11, I invite you to take your Bible if you have access to it and turn with me to the book of Colossians chapter 3, verses 5 through through 11. And if you found the place, would you stand with me, please, in honor of the reading of God's Word. The words will also be on the screen behind me. Colossians 3, verses 5 through 11, I'll read out loud. You read along in your version. Therefore, 
put to death what belongs to your earthly nature, sexual immorality, impurity, lust, evil desire, and greed, which is idolatry. Because of these, God's wrath is coming upon the disobedient. And you once walked in these things when you were living in them. But now, put away all of the following, anger, wrath, malice, slander, and filthy language from your mouth. Do not lie to one another, since you have put off the old self with its practices and have put on the new self. You are being renewed in knowledge according to the image of your Creator. In Christ there is not Greek and Jew, circumcision and uncircumcision, barbarian, Scythian, slave and free, but Christ is all and in all. Heavenly Father, I pray that you would bless not only the reading of your word, but our understanding of it. Give us insight into it. And Father, we pray that if we need to make changes in our lives, that you would grant us the power and the will to do that. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. Before Paul talks about taking off spiritual clothes and putting on spiritual clothes, first he says there are some things that we ought to kill. There are some things that we need to put to death. And we find that again in verse 5, Therefore put to death what belongs to your earthly nature, sexual immorality, impurity, lust, evil desire, and greed, which is idolatry. And when we talk about putting these things to death, what do we mean by that, putting them to death? Well, we really mean what it says. We put it to death. That we, we mortify the deeds of the flesh. I want you to think of it this way. Let's say in your backyard today, there was a snake. Now, some of you know the difference between a garden snake and a rattlesnake and a boa constrictor and everything else. To me, they're all evil. They're all just snakes. And they all deserve the same fate. I don't care if they eat all the cockroaches and the mosquitoes and whatever else, the other creatures that we don't like. Um, to me, they're not my friend. And I care so little about snakes to actually learn the difference between the two, which, you know, which are poisonous, which are not poisonous. doesn't matter to me. I just assume they're all poisonous. And so, you know, what do you do if you have a snake, especially if you were wise enough and understanding enough to know that it's a rattlesnake or it's a copperhead or something that, you know, if it were to bite you, it would change your whole list of priorities that day. Nothing else that you thought you needed to do would actually get done that day, you have a brand new set of priorities if that thing bites you. And that priority happens to be getting to the hospital and praying for anti-venom. So if you had a snake like that in your backyard, what would you do to it? Because you know the potential that it would have to cause you harm. Well, you would seek to put it to death. You would shoot it, and then you would smash it, and then you would cut it up, and then you would bury it, and then you would shoot it again for good measure. You know, you're going to kill it till it's dead, if I can uh, quote Rocky III. Rocky, he's going to kill you till you're dead. You know? So you're going to kill the thing till it's dead, right? That's the type of thing that you need to do with this list of vices that we find in verse 5. Kill them till they're dead, okay? Put them to death. Now, the reason we can put them to death is because we've been unified with Christ. As believers in Jesus Christ, as those who have faith in Jesus Christ, Paul has already taught us earlier in this passage, or excuse me, in this, in this book, he's taught us early, uh, in other books as well, that our union with Christ means that we have died. We've already died with Christ. When Jesus died on the cross, our old self, if you will, died with him. Therefore, these things which belong to the old self, these things need to be put to death. They're, they're still sort of hanging around, and we need to make sure that we put them to death. Now, something other, one little thing that's very specific to this verse. Um, the, you can't really find this out in, in the English translation, but, but in the original translation, in the, or the original language in Greek, this idea of being put to death, it's a very specific tense, a verb. And what Paul is saying is this. Up to this point, you Christians have not been putting these things to death. So start now. Up to this point, you've not taken this seriously. 
Today's the day to start. Start now. Now, if I were to ask you, what day is the day of salvation? I think all of you would be able to say, today can be the day of salvation. That means today can be the day that someone who's not yet a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ can say, I want to be saved. I want Jesus to forgive me. That can happen today. Today can be the day of your salvation. And I would likewise hope and believe that with the same fervor that you might say that, you would also say that today can be the day that I begin putting these things to death. I haven't been doing it yet, but I need to start doing it now. Today, by faith, I'm going to put these things to death. So what are these things? He lit, Paul lists uh, essentially five things here. Paul first lists sexual immorality. Now, sexual immorality um, is, we could define it as basically this. It's any kind of sexual activity outside of marriage. It's a very broad term. It's a term that includes adultery, which is the violation of uh, sexual fidelity within marriage. And what makes adultery especially harmful and, 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 and damaging is that not only is it the act that is harmful, but also the vow that's been taken not to do that act outside of marriage. And so, uh, so sexual immorality, that phrase, includes adultery. It includes premarital sexual, sexual activity. It includes post-marital sexual activity uh, for those that have been widowed or those that have been divorced. Um, sexual immorality essentially means this, that it is any type of activity outside of God's boundary. What's God's boundary? God designed sexual activity to be within the confines of marriage. That's, that's God's ideal. That's what God wants. Outside of that falls into the term called sexual Immorality. Now, sexual immorality is consistently forbidden in Scripture. Old Testament, New Testament, the law, the prophets, Jesus, the Apostle Paul, the other writers of the New Testament, all throughout the Bible, it is forbidden in Scripture. And I want to show you a few Scriptures where Paul talks about it, and, and, and Paul mentions sexual immorality. The old English word, the uh, King James word, is fornication. Paul talks about sexual immorality repeatedly. Because, and, and it's because it's a big deal. And he says in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 9, Do not be deceived. No sexually immoral people, idolaters, adulterers, or males who have sex with males, no thieves, greedy people, drunkards, verbally abusive people, or swindlers will inherit God's kingdom. Okay? You're not going to inherit God's kingdom if you're engaging in those types of activities. The very next verse, by the way, in case you're wondering, oh my goodness, I'm guilty of one of those, or I'm guilty of much of those, or I'm guilty of all of those, or whatever you might be thinking. The very next verse, Paul says, and such were some of you. Some of you used to be that way, but now you're in Christ, and so you, you shouldn't be that way anymore, okay? And so, but the people that are engaging in those things, those, that's indicative of someone who, who is not a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ, who's not taking his or her faith seriously. In that same chapter, in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 18, Paul says this, Flee sexual immorality. Every other sin a person commits is outside the body, but the person who is sexually immoral sins against his own body. In Ephesians chapter 5, verse 5, Paul says this, For know and recognize this, Every sexually immoral or impure or greedy person who is an idolater does not have an inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and of God. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 3 says, For this is God's will, your sanctification, that you keep away from sexual immorality. Now, why is sexual immorality such a big deal? Why does Paul mention it so many times? It's because sexual immorality violates love for neighbor. If you're engaging in sexual immorality, you're guilty of not loving other people the way you should. Now, it's not the only way to violate love for neighbor, but it certainly does violate love for neighbor. And so, love for neighbor is essentially the, the last five through ten of the Ten Commandments. It's it, it's, you know, what God says, honor your father and mother, don't kill, don't commit adultery, don't steal, don't lie, you know, uh, don't covet what's not yours. Those things are all about our relationship with other people. 
Sexual immorality violates that. It damages our relationship with other people. And so the alternative to sexual immorality is abstinence. It's the one alternative, abstinence. That's God's ideal for you unless you're married. And so sexual immorality is the very first thing that Paul says, kill it. It's a damaging enemy that will hurt you. Paul also mentions impurity in that verse. What's impurity? Impurity means the defilement that comes from sexual immorality. And then Paul mentions in that verse lust. Lust is the misdirected fulfillment of sexual appetites. Um, By the way, Scripture is not only... Uh, concerned with your outer actions, but also with your inner heart, too. Okay? And so it's important for us to understand that this is ultimately, at the root, a heart issue. And so after Paul mentions sexual immorality, impurity, he mentions lust, then he comes up with this next word, evil desire, this phrase, evil desire. What's the difference between evil desire and lust? Evil desire is basically lust to the nth degree. Evil desire means uncontrolled and habitual lust. It's the idea of the the lust that you give into for a little bit. Well, now it's really begun to take over your heart. And it's become a driving reason uh, for your existence. And so you you live to lust after someone. You live to, to have these evil desires for someone else. And so it's the idea of lust gone wild. Lust fueling evil desires, and then those evil desires fuel more lust. And so you really spiral down into a a bad place spiritually. And then finally, the Apostle Paul mentions greed. Now, when you and I think of greed, we think of, uh, you know, the pursuit of money, the pursuit of wealth. Uh, But it could actually be broader than that, and it's the idea of covetousness. Covetousness. And so uh, the problem with greed is that we pursue money. And money becomes our end. Money becomes our reason for living. And so money becomes our God. And so we're guilty of idolatry. But if it's broader than that, and it, it includes the idea of any type of covetousness, maybe we covet not so much money, but we covet someone else's possessions. Something that we don't have. It can become our God. Or maybe in our heart we covet a person to be ours. And so we pursue this person And that person, having that person in our lives, uh, becomes our God. It can become anything. It it can become a pursuit of power, coveting power, coveting fame. And so all of this can become an idolatrous uh, substitute for the Lord God in our lives. And so idolatry, in any type of form, violates your love for God. Because it kicks God out of the throne of your heart, and it tries to replace God with something else. And that's a violation of Commandments 1 through 4. Commandments 1 through 4 and the Ten Commandments all talk about our relationship with God. Commandments 5 through 10 talk about our relationship with other people. And so these two items, sexual immorality, Paul mentions a bunch. In fact, Paul has different lists in the New Testament. In the list, Paul mentions sexual immorality eight times in various lists in his his 13 books that he wrote. And in these lists that Paul mentions, he mentions idolatry five times. In the lists alone, not, not mentioning even other passages where he talks about idolatry or sexual immorality. And it's no secret that both of these, you'll find both of these ideas in Romans chapter 1, where Paul basically says, you know, man, mankind has exchanged God for other things, created things. And the natural result of that ultimately becomes some type of sexual immorality. So that the person who does not have faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, the person who's just living for themselves, they're guilty of idolatry, and they're guilty of sexual immorality. And before you know it, they've, they've literally violated all ten of the Ten Commandments. And so this is a problem. And so this idea of idolatry, it's desiring something out of God's will for my life. That's what idolatry is. 
And you might say, well, how do I know it's out of God's will for my life? You know, how do I know that God doesn't want me to have $10 million? Well, let me ask you a question. Do you have $10 million right now? No. Then it's not God's will right now for you to have $10 million. If it was God's will for you to have $10 million, you would have $10 million. So what God is saying is don't make your life about the pursuit of the $10 million. You should pursue God. You should pursue God. People say, well, I really want this other person. I want this person in my life. I want, to, I want to marry this person, but this person doesn't even know I exist. I'm just going to pursue this person, make my whole life about pursuing this person. Listen, is it God's will for you right now to have this other person in your life as your spouse? No. Why? How do you know? Because they're not your spouse. How about this? How about instead of pursuing this other person and making that person pl- take the throne of your heart, how about you pursue God? God is very capable of giving you that person if God wants you to get, have that person. In fact, last time I checked, there are 3.5, approximately, billion people of the opposite sex that God might give you if you're looking for a spouse. God's very capable of sending you somebody. Your pursuit ought to be of God, not of a person, not of wealth, not of anything else that, become, that can become an idol in your life. And so these ideas, are, are these, these sins really, are things that you ought to kill. Get them out of your life. Why? Look at the next verse. Verse 6. Because of these things that you ought to kill, God's wrath is coming upon the disobedient. What does that mean, God's wrath is coming? Well, I may not know everything that... It means when it says God's wrath is coming, but I know I don't want it. Okay? And I want you to understand something about God's wrath. God's wrath is not God just losing it emotionally. Okay? God doesn't lose it emotionally. Okay? He's not like us in that way. God's wrath is not just God having a bad day and taking it out on somebody. It's not God sitting up on his throne, you know, deciding I'm going to fire a lightning bolt at that person. Zah! You know, get that person. That's not God's wrath at all. God's wrath is a settled disposition against sin and sinners. It's where God has, if you want to use the word decided, I don't even like to say that when it comes to decided, because God's wrath is really part of his nature. It's not a it's not a choice that he made so much, but it's, it's rather who he is and the depth of his being. God is holy and God is righteous. And in the depth of God's being, God has settled the issue that sin is abhorrent to him. And those who commit sin are guilty. And they will be the recipients of God's wrath unless... They find mercy somehow. We know the only way to find mercy is through Jesus Christ, who took on the wrath of God when he died on the cross. He did that on our behalf. He did that in our stead. And so God's wrath is coming. The idea here is that there's coming a day when it will be too late. So today's the day to kill it. Today's the day to kill these five things. Why? Because God's wrath may be right around the corner. And you don't want to experience that. God has settled his disposition against sin. And you don't want to find yourself on that side of things. There's a second reason that we find in the very next verse in verse 7, which is on the screen. Because of these, God's wrath is coming upon the disobedient, and you once walked in these things. You used to be all about these things. You once walked in these things when you were living in them. You were like the prodigal son down in the mud with the pig. The prodigal son 
got out of the mud. He left that behind, and he went back to his daddy. You used to be this way. And so this, these things that are listed in verse, in verse 5, these five things that you ought to kill, these are indicative of your former life. And so I want you to understand that sexual sins, they harm you. They harm you. Sexual sins defile relationships. They just do. I'm not going to ask anyone to raise their hand, but I wonder how many of us have had some type of sexual activity with somebody else and it completely forever and irrevocably changed the relationship and it destroyed it. It destroyed a friendship. It destroyed the relationship. Sexual relationships, sexual sins, I should say, defile relationships. Sexual sins also diminish your view of God. Why? Because you basically, as a Christian, you're saying this. If you're engaged in some type of sexual sin, you're basically saying, you know, God, hey, you know, I need you to get off here to the side a little bit. Because the most important thing for me is my sexual gratification. So, God, you just sort of get over here. And you start to have a diminished view of God. No longer is God the Lord and King of every aspect of your life, but it's as if you push Him aside. And so when you engage in sexual sins, you have a diminished view of God. And it should not be that way if you're a believer. Do not let it get that way. Sexual sins also cause a lack of self-control. They get to the point where you, you feel like, you know, you just have to, have to do it, and that it's not even you that's doing it. You feel like you're, in, you're being controlled by another force, another power. And so sexual sins are very powerful. And a lot of, a lot of people wonder, well, you Christians, y'all are always just real caught up in sexual activity, and y'all are just leave people alone. And Well, let me just, let me just address something, you know. Uh, you know, it may be that, that a lot of Christians in America or wherever have uh, gotten, you know, too caught up in, in sexual activity and, and make it a, some, ty- some type of a worse sin than any other type of sin. Uh, but let me also just balance that with this. We're not making it up. It's been here in the book for about two millennia. These are not new things, okay? And so I know it's everybody's habit in America to start dating and then have sex, and then cohabitate, and then maybe down the line think about whether to marry. That seems to be the course of things. God's plan is a little different. God's plan is not hidden from you. It's right here. Sexual immorality is bad for you. God says don't do it. Okay? And so it's important for us to maintain the standard. It's also important for us to let people know that there's forgiveness. There's grace and forgiveness when there's been a violation, when there's been a sin. When Jesus died on the cross, he died for all types of sins, not just certain types of sins, not just for, you know, little white sins or little, little know-nothing sins or something like that. He, he, when he died on the cross, he died for whatever you and I might consider to be the big sins too. And so there's forgiveness, there's grace for those that find themselves to have failed. And not lived up to God's standard. Nevertheless, the standard of God is very clear in Scripture. So Paul says there are certain things you ought to kill. And then he says there's other things that you ought to discard. Like a piece of clothing. Like a sweaty, nasty, torn piece of clothing. You ought to get rid of it. And put it aside. And we find those things beginning in verse 8. And the top of verse 9. But now, Paul says, put away all of the following. Anger, wrath, malice, slander, and filthy language from your mouth. Do not lie to one another. These are things that you ought to discard. These are things like a filthy garment you ought to get rid of. Paul lists them here. He says anger. Anger is something that you ought to discard. Now, someone might say, well, doesn't the Bible say be angry and do not sin? It sure does. Didn't Jesus get angry when he, when he uh, you know, cleaned out the temple? He sure did. But there's a difference there. 
That's a righteous anger. The anger that we're dealing with here is the anger that probably you're more likely to, uh, to experience, and it's a selfish anger. You didn't get your way, and so you're angry. Now, the word anger here literally means this. It's the slow boil of emotion that increases and increases until it burns white hot and it will scorch anything that it touches. It, it's that seething anger. It's that anger that it's just building up and building up and building up in you. Put it away. You need to learn to put it away. The next word that we read is wrath. What's wrath? What's the difference between anger and wrath? The word wrath means a sudden explosive outburst of anger. Boom! And, I mean, there's all kinds of destruction when that person finally blows up. That's wrath. That's not a good thing. It's a lack of self-control. The next thing we read is the word malice. Malice is an evil attitude, wishing for harm to come on other people. That's malice. For secretly in your heart, you're like, boy, I, I, I just hope for bad things to happen to that person. By the way, gossipers usually have hearts filled with malice. Oh, did you hear? Did you hear the tragedy that happened to this person? Oh, bless his heart. Did you hear? Gossipers have hearts of malice, usually. The next word continues that idea. It's slander. Slander means it's words that are spoken and meant to disparage other people. Words that are meant to cut other people down. To make them small, perhaps smaller than you. And usually, teenagers, when someone at school or on social media slanders you, it's because they feel very bad about themselves. And the only way they can build themselves up is to cut you down. And unfortunately, adults, some of us never get beyond that as teenagers. And it's a shame. Slander, something that we ought to put off. Filthy language. These are foul or obscene words. Especially these words when they're directed at somebody that you oppose or that you feel opposes you. Cutting them down with foul and obscene words that they have no answer to. By the way, this includes taking the Lord's name in vain. Because when you take the Lord's name in vain, when you use the name of God, the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, as a cuss word, when you do that, you're essentially, whether you realize it or not, opposing Him. And you're using Him and His good name as a foul, obscene weapon in your hand. That should not be. And finally, in the, in the next verse, and the, this, this one is sort of set aside because it has its own sentence. Paul says, do not lie to one another. Lies. These are deliberate attempts at untruthfulness. Deception. It includes giving half-truths to convey the wrong impression. There are times when you don't have to say everything you know. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about when you give a half-truth in order to intentionally deceive the other person into thinking the reality is something else. That's a lie. That's wrong. It includes prideful exaggeration. You're lying about yourself. Because I'm so great. I'm so wonderful. I'm so this. I'm so that. Prideful exaggeration or lies. Distorting facts, taking something that you know is true and distorting the fact, misquoting it, misquoting the person intentionally in order to make it something else. 
mainstream journalists are fabulous at this. I've been quoted a handful of times by mainstream journalists. I have yet to be quoted accurately. It's amazing, absolutely amazing. The distortion of facts, all kinds of lies, this should all be discarded from our lives. What's the tying factor in with everything in verses 8 and 9? It's words. Words. We need to understand the nature of words. Words do more than simply convey meaning. You're not just a dictionary, okay? Words do more than simply convey meaning. Angry words do more than just let off steam. I hear people that have a problem with things. I'm just letting off steam. I'm just letting off steam. No, you're doing a lot more than that. You're causing a lot of damage while you're letting off steam. Deceptive words do more than simply adjust the narrative. Words have power. Words have the power to absolutely change relationships. Words have the power to wound, sometimes irrevocably. We must be careful with our words. Now, none of us can stop using words. But there are certain things we do with our words, certain things we do with our speech that need to be put away, taken off. If you find that you have been a liar as a Christian, put it off. Take it off. Don't be that anymore. If you've been a gossiper and a slanderer, just stop. Don't pick up that phone. Don't send that email. Don't send that text. Just stop. Put it off. Take it off. Why should we discard these things? Because spiritually, you're part of the kingdom of God. You're part of God's kingdom. Look at how verse 9 continues. It says, Do not lie to one another. Since you have put off the old self with its practices, you died on the cross with Christ. You've put that off. You've died to that old self with its practices, and you've put on a new self. You are being renewed in knowledge according to the image of your Creator. You're becoming more like Christ. Christ would not be involved in the things we see in verses 8 and 9. So neither should you. Not only are you part of God's kingdom, but you also have new values. Look at verse 11. We read, in Christ, there is not Greek and Jew. What's that mean, Greek and Jew? It means there are no ethnic divisions in Christ. Are there different ethnic distinctions? Sure. I am my ethnicity. You are your ethnicity. And that's a good thing. That you are your ethnicity. That I am my ethnicity. Your ethnicity is a gift from God. Your ethnicity is a sacred thing. And for anybody to think, well, I'm more valuable because I'm white than someone who is a, of a darker skin. That's ridiculous. And the vi vice versa, the opposite, just as ridiculous. We are all incredibly, incredibly valuable to God, and God made us the way we are. Not one of us here chose our biological parents. You are whatever God made you to be, and that is a gift. Okay? And so in Christ, ethnic distinctions obviously still exist, but they're not divisions. We're not divided in Christ according to ethnicity. Neither Greek nor Jew, neither circumcision or uncircumcision, religious background does not divide us in Christ. Neither barbarian or Scythian. What are these? Barbarian, Scythian. In, in the kingdom of Rome at the time, the people that could not speak Greek were called barbarians. These are non-Greek speaking people. And so... The people that were in Rome might look down upon people that couldn't speak Greek. It would be like you. 
looking down upon someone who spoke Spanish but could not speak English. That's not right. That's not right. That person is so much more than their ability to speak your language. Okay? And so in Christ, there are no divisions like that. God can hear any language. The Scythians, who were the Scythians? There were the, some tribes around the Black Sea that were known to be exceptionally cruel, exceptionally crude. I won't get into the details of what they would do in war, but it was it's pretty nasty. Okay, and so the Scythians were people that everyone looked down upon. They were the dregs of society, if you will. In Christ, there are no dregs of society. It didn't matter. In Christ, there's no slave or free. What's that indicative of? It's, it's indicative of um, economic divisions. There are no economic divisions in Christ. The poorest person in this room is just as much in Christ as the wealthiest is just as valuable as the wealthiest. In fact, may even be more so. That is for God to judge. Okay? There are no divisions of wealth in Christ. No divisions of ethnicity. No divisions of religious background or cultural background in Christ. Why? Because of that last phrase. Christ is all and in all. When we say that Christ is all and he is in all, that means that Christ is our total concern. Christ is our preoccupation. And so my life, if I'm looking, if I'm single and I'm looking for a wife, my life should not be about finding a wife. It ought to be about pleasing Christ. He is my preoccupation. If I'm looking, perhaps if I feel like I need a new job, I, you know, I, I'm not making enough money, my life should not simply be about finding another job, but it should be about seeking to be unified at all times with Christ and asking for His help in those matters. Christ is all and in all. He is our environment. And so today... If you're a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ, you may need to flee sexual immorality. You may need to put some idols in your heart aside. You may need to disrobe of some of the ways that you've been speaking as of late. And instead speak the things that are pleasing to Christ. In essence, Christians ought to live differently. We ought to be different from the world. If the world looks at us and says, yeah, what's the difference between you and me? Then we've got a problem. We ought to live very differently from the world. If you're a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ, you have died to sin, so therefore live like it. But if you're not yet a believer, please understand this. God does not expect you to clean up your act in order for you to become good enough for him. That's not the way it works. Okay? God expects you, if you're not yet a believer in Christ and you've been thinking, you know, maybe I want to follow Jesus, maybe I want to become a, a believer in Jesus, God wants you to do one thing. He wants you to believe in Him. He wants you to follow Jesus. You might say, well, what about all this mess in my life that you've identified in these verses? You know, I got a, I'm guilty of a bunch of it. God will clean that up later. God will give you the power through His Holy Spirit who will come to dwell in your life to clean that up later. Your sin needs to be dealt with. Your sin needs to be forgiven. And God is perfectly able to forgive you of your sins. All you have to do is believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. Understand who He is. He is the Lord over all. That means that He's the boss. He's the king. He's the one in charge. You have to understand what he did for you. He died on the cross for you. He rose from the grave to give you eternal life. And so if you will believe in him and trust in him as Lord, confess him as Lord, he will come into your life and he will forever change you.